Turn in your King James Bible to the book of Philippians. This week we're going to be talking about pre-trib rapture scriptures in the book of Philippians. If you've been following these studies, you know that we've been going through the Pauline epistles, beginning in the book of Romans. We're going to go the whole way through to Philemon. And we're going to see that Paul over and over and over again refers to the Christians being called up before the time of Jacob's trouble, commonly called the pre-trib rapture. Again, I've covered that in many studies, and I'll say it one more time because I just need to keep, continue to reinforce this. There is no time period called the tribulation or the great tribulation. Uh, that is a false teaching. Uh, the time is called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7 or Daniel's 70th week back in the book of Daniel. Never in the Bible, the King James Bible at least, is this statement, the tribulation, given as a title. It's a description. There will be tribu tribulation and great tribulation in that time period, but the post-trib Catholics out there have basically, you know, made a, a, you know, phrase part of the vocabulary of Christianity, and it has no basis in Scripture. And I use it only because most people that are deceived by this movement, you know, that they're they think of this term tribulation and if I would say the time of Jacob's trouble, they most people don't know what that means. So uh, that's why I'm using it. Not because it's what the Bible teaches, it's just because that's what people hear about. But I'm going to show you that there are many, many places, because one of the big things that they'll say, there are no scriptures that point to a pre-trib rapture. There are many of them. I've gone over them. It's quite a few. And there's quite a few in the book of Philippians. But let's start out here. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, um, grace and peace are there for you as a Christian today, living in the church age, this time period between, between the... Uh, Resurrection of Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the rapture, the catching away of the bride of Christ. Okay? We have grace and we have peace. And I'll talk about this again because some of you might be new to this study. Turn in your Bible, keep your hand there in Philippians chapter 1 and go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. I'm going to show you why this thing does not work. Why you can't make Philippians and say, well, that's just written to anybody, a Christian that goes into the tribulation. I'll show you why it doesn't work. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Okay. Um, how then... Could the Lord, could you take the Lord seriously, we'll say it that way, if over here he's inspiring Paul to say, grace and peace be unto you, but back here in Revelation 6, 4, he's telling John, this red horse rider goes out and he takes peace from the earth. And you know, you, people will say, well, that means you know peace in the sense of worldly peace and things like this, but a Christian can still have peace in that time. How could you? It was Jesus that opened the seal that released the red horse rider and the white horse rider before that, the, the Antichrist, is who's defined in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. Jesus Christ is the one that's unleashing this. So how can you have grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ when they're the ones that are sending these judgments on the earth? See, it doesn't work. You see, the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's properly called, that time, this written about here in the book of Revelation, that time is there to judge the lost world. Specifically so, Jacob, Israel. You see, they rejected their Messiah way back there in the first century, and the Lord's been dealing with the Gentiles now for almost 2,000 years, and now He's going to turn His attention back to the nation of Israel, and He's going to give them signs and wonders, which is the book of Revelation, it's signs and wonders, over and over and over again, all these seven, you know, the, the trumpets, the uh, seal, or excuse me, the seven trumpets, seven, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. I'll get it out. You know, it's for the Jews. 
That's what the whole time period is for. And for not just for the Jews, but anybody that was not truly saved. God's not going to pour out His judgment on His own body. We're going to see that in this study. So you can turn back to Revel or, uh, excuse me, Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter 1. Now let's look at verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Stop right there for a minute. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What's that talking about? Well, it's talking about the rapture. It's talking about when we go up. That's the day of Jesus Christ. We'll see that as we continue here. But um, if you want to keep your finger right there and go back to Romans chapter 13, comparing Scripture with Scripture. And notice I'm staying in the Pauline epistles as well, by the way. Not running back to the Gospels or to the Old Testament to prove things for a Christian today. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. It says here, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And I talked about this back in the Romans study, and but a lot of people don't think about this. They say, well, when you're saved, you just that's it. You're that's our salvation. It's complete in Jesus Christ. Well, that's true in terms of you don't have to worry about doing something else to be saved. But the fact of the matter is, our salvation is not complete here on this earth. It's not complete until we go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, your soul and your spirit, your soul is redeemed, your spirit is quickened, but your body remains corruptible. Your body stays in a corrupted state. That's why you still struggle with sin as a Christian. In spite of what some of the uh, holiness types of people try to teach you, that somehow you can live without sinning. Uh, no, no. You will not live without sinning. I mean, you will have a changed life, but there's not. There's going to be still a struggle for sin there. Absolutely. But when you see these people that they really don't struggle with their sin and they don't really have any conviction about sin, then you're dealing with a false convert. There will be a changed life, of course, but you're still going to have struggles with sin. That's what the Bible teaches. Read Romans chapter 7 if you don't know what I'm talking about there. But uh, turn next to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to see about this thing of our salvation. Ephesians chapter 1. And again, this is, this is Ephesians chapter 1. If you want to, uh, they say, do you have any script, scriptures to prove a pre-trib rapture? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, the whole chapter, is the greatest proof of a pre-trib rapture, if you want to use their terminology, uh, that there is. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, says here that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That verse right there destroys the whole post-trib system. Any aspect of it. The whole way through the tribulation post-tribber or the pre-wrath, uh, mid-trib types of people. If you're there for the mark of the beast, which shows up at the very beginning when the Antichrist shows up. If you're there for any part of this uh, tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, if you're there for any part of it, you can uh, disobey that verse there. You can get the Lord to, you know, mess up that verse. Why? Take the mark. He has to damn you to hell. But it says there that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. One verse, and it destroys the whole post-trib system. But look at verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. And again, I'm just covering this another time. I know that those of you that, have, that faithfully watch these studies, you're nodding your head, you're going, yep, we've heard this before. Yeah, you know, I'm renewing your mind. We have to keep these things in mind because the doubts will arise at some point in time. You'll start seeing things get really bad and you'll go, I wonder if we might be here for the thing. <laughs> keep this stuff in mind, okay? Keep these scriptures in mind that God has given us special promises that do not exist for people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Or for people in the Old Testament either, for that matter. We have very special promises that are given to us as Christians that other people don't have in other dispensations. So, 
you see it here in Philippians ver, chapter 1, verse 6, that he which hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And that's very true for us today. Our salvation, the redemption of our bodies, is getting closer all the time. There's going to come a point in time, brother, sister, where you're going to hear your name called and you're going to go up to meet the Lord in the air and each other, all the Christians are going to meet. That's the day of Jesus Christ. The body of Christ right now is separated. The dead saints are there with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. The living saints are here on the earth, connected spiritually but not physically. But at the rapture we will be. We'll all be gathered together in one in Christ Jesus. The redemption of the purchased possession. One of the greatest, most important doctrines of uh, New Testament Christianity. And yet many people say it's a false doctrine and a lie. Uh, that's very serious. You need to be real careful calling something that important a lie. It's not a lie. But let's continue. Verse 7. Even as, it is, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. Boy, I can give a definite amen to all that. You know, verse 8 there, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. You know, it, one of the most frustrating things for me as a preacher is when I hear Christians that are struggling in situations and I know that there's really nothing I can do to help them. You know, people that are in bad marriages, people that are in bad health, people that have financial problems and stuff like that. And I'm just going, even so, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> That's the solution. I mean, if you're a Christian, you're struggling with things, especially today. If you're a Christian, uh, you're getting real sick and tired of going to the grocery store and hearing rock music and other kinds of foul, wicked stuff going on and you're, if you're a Christian, you're, you're dealing with family members that, are, that hate your guts right now. Um, you're going through some stuff. I know you are. I hear about it. I, I get a lot of emails and a lot of letters and things and comments, and I, I, I see it. What's it, it do for me? I greatly long after you all. I just wish I could just say, okay, you know, if the Lord said, hey, you know, uh, Brian... When do you want the rapture to happen? I'd say, now. So you mean like 10 minutes? From, no, Lord, now. <laughs> Let's go now. Why? Because I know it's going to be a, a glorious reunion of the body of Christ. It's going to be an amazing time. But this is my prayer for you. Verse 9, that your love may abound yet more and more in tolerance and diversity. Uh, no, actually, it doesn't say that. Uh, your love more and more for the things of this world so that you get along more with your friends and family and colleagues. and stuff. That doesn't say that. Your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Did you know that you can have love in judgment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, if you're a sodomite out there, and I tell you that you are an abomination. What you're doing is a sin. It's an abomination. God hates what you're doing. You know what I'm doing? I'm showing you love in judgment. I mean, think about what, what is sodomy. Sodomy, two men or essentially two women. There's really no Bible word that's given for two women being together. So we, you know, I usually just classify them under sodomy. Two men, two women that are having to do more and more perverse things with each other to get their thrill, and they're totally sterile. They cannot produce children. They can't ever know the joy of having a child of their own. And they have to go around you know, proclaiming their sin and, and things like this. It's a terrible lifestyle. It's a horrible lifestyle. Hey, if you're a Roman Catholic, 
you know what the very best Roman Catholic has? You know what I mean? I'll say it this way. What does the Vatican have to offer the very best Roman Catholic? Doubt. A life of doubt. A life of fear. What if I die and I'm not in a state of grace? What if I commit a mortal sin? Venial sins can be forgiven, but what if I commit a mortal sin? How much time am I going to have to burn in pur purgatory? You know, they teach that popes are going to have to burn in purgatory? I mean, that's well, blessed assurance, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, I don't think so. The very best Catholic is going to have to burn when they die. What a, what a wonderful thing. Oh, great and precious promises. You say, well, you're judging me. I'm a, Catholic. I'm a Roman Catholic and you're judging me. Yes, because I love you. Love in judgment. And we all need to abound more and more in that. Love in judgment. Hey, if you're in the military, and we come out and we say, I doubt your salvation if you're just totally in the military, full time in the military. Why am I saying that? Because the rules of the military are wicked. The system of the military here in America is wicked. It's it's terrible. And they ask, don't ask, don't tell, and all this other policies and stuff like this. It's a wicked thing. As a Christian, it will kill your spiritual life. I'm not saying that there are no people in the military that, that are not saved or that can't get saved. You'll get saved in all kinds of wicked situations. I understand that as a Christian. But if you stay in that thing, it will kill you spiritually. You might go to heaven, but you aren't going to have too many rewards because you're not allowed to witness. You're not allowed to tell people that sodomy is wicked and whatever else. You know, if you're if you're eating fast food and stuff like that, and I come out and I judge you by saying that that stuff is toxic, I'm practicing love and judgment. You see, the things that we rebuke, the things that we're hard on here, and people get offended by, we're showing love and judgment. Verse 10, that ye may approve things that are excellent. You know, that's a thing that my wife and I have dedicated ourselves to. We approve things that are excellent. We're not going to get on camera and recommend anything to any of you unless we have proved it in our own lives. We're going to go through it first. Somebody gives us some food and they say, hey, try this. This will help your health out. I'm not going to say, hey, I recommend this food. Eat it. It's good for you. Did you ever try it? No, but I know it's good for you, so you go ahead and eat it. I'm not going to do that. We approve things are ex that are excellent so we can tell you about it. And that's what you need to do for other people. Hey, I've tried this thing. I listen to what Brother Brian and Sister Catherine say. I've tried it. It works really, really well. You tell other people about it. That's what our job is here. Until the Lord catches us away, we are supposed to have love and judgment. We are supposed to approve things that are excellent. That ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. You know, there again, a lot of people think if you're not soft, soft and effeminate as a preacher and you just go along with whatever everybody says and just be a yes man, then you're not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, no, <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. We're supposed to tell the truth. And when I speak the truth in love, when my wife speaks the truth in love, you know, again, she says, she'll say something. I've seen people, they get offended. They'll, you know, she'll say the medical goons or things like that. She'll attack people in the medical field. <laughs> the people in the medical field are hurting people. Okay. And don't tell me all oh, ignorance and stuff like this. If you're seeing that you're treating people with certain things and they're not getting any better and yet you continue doing it, you're, you got some problems. Okay? What are we doing? We are proving things. We are loving people in judgment. That's our job as Christians until the day of redemption. Until the Lord says, okay, well done thou good and faithful servant. Come on up. And we leave. And what's going to happen? Well, more and more, the, the longer we're here, the less people are going to want to hear it. And so the Lord's eventually going to get to a place where He's going to say, Hey, you people have had the warnings. You've been told. You won't take heed. You've seen proof after proof after proof. Okay. You're going to go through it. You're going to go through my wrath. And up goes the body of Christ, and down comes the wrath.
And it starts at the beginning, too, by the way. Don't fall for that lie. That they say, oh, it starts halfway through. No, it doesn't. It gets worse halfway through. But God's wrath starts at the very beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. He unleashes the Antichrist. You know, take the mark, you get what? God's wrath. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. Talked about that before. But let's continue here. Philippians chapter 1, go down to verse 21. Again, keep these things in mind. Christian versus somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the whole point of these studies. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Okay. Um, are you having a desire to depart from this world and to be with Christ? Yes. Will it be far better than this life? Yes. <laughs> uh, what What's going on here? What are we seeing? Well, again, we're seeing Paul looking forward to this day, the day of redemption. He's looking forward to it. Well, what about if you're a uh, saint in the time of Jacob's trouble? Are you guaranteed those same precious promises? No, you're not. If you take the mark of the beast, it doesn't matter how much faith you have in Jesus or how much profession of faith or whatever. You take the mark, you go to hell. Just as simple as that. Next, go down to Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Another convicting thing here. Philippians 3, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might or that I may win Christ. Hmm. You know, when you look at your lost life and you think back to, to what you had to give up to be a Christian, and you do have to give up things to be a Christian, anybody that gets saved knows that, they understand that. You might not understand the full ramifications of it. I grant you there's sanctification that comes afterwards. But you realize, hey, this salvation is going to mean a changed life. You know, and these people that are against that, that rail against the changed life, uh, it's because they don't want to give up certain things. But uh, you see, when you realize going to hell for eternity or giving up these things and going to heaven... When I put my faith in Jesus, there's going to be that changed life. Gee, let me think about that. You know, uh, you count all that stuff that, that you gave up in your lost life, all the old friends and all the old life and everything else, you count it but dung. Why? That I may win, that I may win Christ. You see? That's the way this thing is. I mean, do you think I care about uh, sports or movies or, or fashion or whatever else? Do you think I would willingly give up my faith in Jesus Christ and my salvation to become a Hollywood movie star? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't think so. There's nothing in this world that would make me want to give up my salvation. Not one thing. Better think about that if you're lost, by the way. And by the way, the reason I put those verses in there. I know it's it's not, you say, well, how does this prove a pre trip rapture? Well, it's more so just to get you to think about what you're doing with your life. Um, those things, there's going to be some loss at uh, the rapture. All this stuff here, everything is going to be left behind. Somebody's going to come in and find this stuff. Well, then, uh, and you know, these are books and stuff out here, you know, commentaries and things, good stuff here. But I'm saying, uh, you know, you say, well, brother, I just, I got to have a brand new truck. I got to have just the newest one and, and uh, it's really, really neat. These new ones that came out and they have a nice, uh, the limited feature and things like this. And, and, uh, and what? It's going to be left behind. There's something to think about. Just a little challenge there. 
we all need to keep that stuff in mind. It's, there's nothing wrong with having some things and, and uh, being blessed by the Lord and, and having uh, decent vehicles and you know decent place to live and whatever else and some nice possessions. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're spending all your time on that and not on things that are going to be eternal, things that you can take with you when you go up, your rewards in heaven, what you've done for the Lord, not what you've done for your own glory, but what you've done for the Lord Jesus Christ. The times that you've put tracts out, the times that you've read your Bible, the times that you've prayed, when you could have been doing other more fun things, those are the things that are going to go with you. Those are the things that are going to matter to you in eternity. I mean, you know, you have a, a valuable antique whatever, uh, a, a special painting or something, we'll say, and it's worth a lot of money. You think you're going to care about that painting when you're up there with the Lord in heaven walking on streets of gold? Uh, you know, boy, i got to think about this money in my wallet here. Boy, I can't stand to think of this, this money being left behind. Oh, it's terrible. This money's toilet paper, <laughs> okay? Uh, paper money. It's not even real money. It's not even what the Constitution stipulated. Nothing but gold or silver coins shall be used in payment of debts, both public and private. Side issue. But the point is, we need to think about that. Not only did we give up stuff when we got saved, we're going to be giving up a lot when we go to be with the Lord. So don't spend all your time down here on this earth wasting your time trying to achieve earthly fortunes and wealth. Spend your time working for the Lord. See, and again, that does prove the whole pre-trib thing. Why? Jesus is coming soon. What do you want to do? Work for the Lord? Hey, the Antichrist is coming soon in the New World Order. Tribulation. What are you going to do? Stockpile your supplies to make it through the seven years. You see? And by the way, you know, I'm not saying that people shouldn't have some, some food set back or some things like that. I mean, there could be a financial collapse before the rapture. I don't know. I'm not telling you to just live totally unprepared and just say, Lord's always going to keep, you know, us happy, you know, uh, well-fed people here in America. I don't know. I don't know. There's some wisdom in having some supplies set back and saying, okay, not that I don't trust the Lord, but hey, I understand things are bad in this country. Okay, there's no problem there. But when you're stocking up and saving up for seven years... And you're saying there will be no rapture. We're going through it, you know, all this stuff. Eh, eh. You're getting off there. But let's continue. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable, conformable unto his death. Uh, again, you know, tying in with the Millennial Kingdom study. Uh, the only thing that you need to do to be able to inherit promises in the Millennial Kingdom, the only thing that you need to do is suffer for the Lord. And if you live for Jesus, you will suffer. It's just that simple. But notice there, that I may know Him. You want to know Jesus Christ? So, well, yeah, I do know Him at salvation. That's not what it's talking about here. Yeah, that's how it begins. But the way you know Jesus Christ is, and the power of His resurrection... Do you have power since you become a new creature in Christ Jesus? Do you have a changed life? That's what it's talking about, the power of his resurrection. You read back in Romans chapter 6, I believe it is, talks about being buried with him in death, being raised in power. The old man, when it dies, that old man couldn't understand the Bible. That old man couldn't witness for Jesus Christ. That old man can't live right. But when you kill that old man, you say, okay, that old man's buried and now raised up as a new man, that new man's going to have a changed life. Not sinlessly perfect. I've never taught that. People will lie about me, say that I've taught that. I never taught that. You can watch all my videos. I have never once said that you can be sinlessly perfect as a Christian. Anybody that says that is a liar. I mean, actually, I've actually preached sermons against the thing of sinless perfection. But you will have a new life as a Christian. You know Jesus Christ for salvation. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. The power of His resurrection. What comes next? The fellowship of His sufferings. Study the life of Jesus sometime. 
you will have those people around you that are friends, kind of like disciples. But guess who's going to be in with them? You're going to have a John. John that loved Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Excuse me, say it that way. You're going to have somebody that really, truly, you know that they love you as your brother or sister in the Lord. You're going to have a Peter, somebody that uh, misrepresents you sometimes and somebody that's really good. Uh, they'll say things and repeat things that you've said. They're very outspoken. You'll have that. You also have sort of the silent kind of a, you know, some of the disciples, you don't really hear a whole lot about them. They're just there. They're just faithful. Sure. But guess what else you're going to have? You're also going to have a Judas Iscariot. Somebody that you really trusted, somebody that you really thought was a friend, somebody that you really thought was helping you in the ministry, and a you know, great companion, fellow soldier and stuff in the Lord, and they'll turn right around and stab you in the back. What's going on there? The fellowship of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. You'll go back to uh, people that you thought were your friends, your family and stuff like that, when you get to live and write with the Lord, and all of a sudden you're going to find that uh, a prophet hath no honor in his own country and among his own kin. I'm paraphrasing there. You're going to see that. Being made conformable unto his death. Well, the Bible says that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12. Are you willing to... Uh, Crucify the flesh. The Bible tells us to mortify our members. Yeah. In other words, when your flesh says, I want to do things that are contrary to the Word of God, you have to say no to that. And it's always positive too, by the way, as I've said in other studies. Every time you tell your body, no, you're not going to do this, you're not going to drink that soda, you're not going to overeat, you're not going to oversleep, you're not going to smoke that cigarette, you're not going to look at that pornography, you're not going to whatever. It's always positive. It's always good for you. But it sure is hard to tell the flesh no sometimes, isn't it? It sure is hard to tell the flesh no sometimes when the flesh says, I'm coveting that item. I struggle with that. I'll be very honest. There are times I struggle with covetousness. And you've got to tell the flesh no. You're crucifying the flesh. Being made conformable unto his death. You've got to get on the cross and let the Lord crucify you. Sometimes. Not physically thankfully. <laughs> but, you know, spiritually speaking, you have to be willing to get on the cross and let the Lord tell you, hey, that needs to go. That part of you needs to go. You need to kill that thing right there. But let's continue. And by the way, you say again, I forgot to make a point of looking at my notes here. You say, well, how does this prove a pre-trib rapture? Well, think about it that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Well, how can you take it and say, well, I'm suffering here in this time of Jacob's trouble if the body of Christ goes through it when Jesus Christ is the one who's pouring out these judgments upon you? It's a weird setup. I mean, it's just one of the basic things that you can understand about why Christians won't go through the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, I mean, if we go into the time of Jacob's trouble, Jesus Christ is literally pouring out judgments upon his own body. You know? I mean, Jesus is not a, a sadomasochistic type of a guy, okay? You know? I mean, walking around, slapping himself in the face, and, you know, and hitting himself and thing. No, that's not the Lord Jesus Christ. We are members of his body. Of course, he's not going to pour out his judgment on us. Give me a break. But let's continue. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21. Brethren, be followers together of me, and walk, mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ. How do you identify them? Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Every post-tribber minds earthly things. It's exactly what they do. 
I showed my video the thing about Jim Baker. Oh, you're going to be here for it. The pre-trib pre -trib rapture is a lie. Millions are going to be deceived. Millions are going to die waiting for a pre-trib rapture. Uh, what are we supposed to do? Or call now and order these buckets behind me here in the Jim Baker studio. You know, we sell solar panels and survival goodies and wind up radios and water purifiers. And, you know, I mean, what, you're going to get a, a, a water purifier that's going to make, you know, the blood that's turned, you know, the, the water that's turned into blood. It's going to purify that, you know, okay, <laughs> you know, ridiculous. Verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Antichrist when the first seal is open. Oh no, it didn't say that. It says, uh, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Did you get that? Read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. In fact, just read the whole chapter sometime, and you'll see about the thing of when we are changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you know, this corruptible becomes incorruption. What is that? You say, well, it's the second coming of Christ after the tribulation. Okay, really? Show me that wording anywhere in Matthew chapter 24 about incorruption or corruption, you know, corruptible being being made into incorruptible flesh. Show it to me. It's not there. You know why? It's two different events. Second coming, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. That's the second coming. The rapture, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Ephesians chapter 1. Colossians, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 3. Verse 20 and 21, another pre-trib rapture scripture. Oh, it's so terrible, isn't it? And it's so funny, too. I've seen these guys, these big mouth post-tribbers. Show me one verse of scripture that teaches a pre-trib rapture. Well, I can show you lots of them, you know. And then they, there's a couple guys now that are saying, I think this uh, Schimmel guy or whatever, he's saying a $10,000 rapture challenge. I got another book here someplace. I already refuted the thing. Uh, I have no idea where it's at right now, but it was some some dumb, dumb nut. Oh, yeah. Uh, Speed Wilson. H. Speed Wilson. Colonel, U.S. Military, or U.S. Marine Corps, excuse me. Colonel H. Speed Wilson. Um, right there. You know, this book here. $10,000 challenge. He's dead, and, you know, and the way he writes, he's probably in hell, unfortunately, for the guy. But, you know... <laughs> $10,000 to anybody can prove a pre-trib rapture. And, you know, I know how these snakes work. And I, I showed it in this book, my book review of that thing. They'll say, you know, any clear scriptures that prove a pre-trib rapture. And you show them these clear scriptures, they go, but it doesn't say pre-trib rapture. <laughs> so they create a false thing of the tribulation as a title for the coming time period. And they'll say pre-trib rapture. And so you got to prove the pre-trib rapture. You say, well, I can prove the scriptures that show we're going to be called out before... Yes, but it doesn't say pre-trib rapture, so you don't get the $10,000. <laughs> People are deceivers. It's just disgusting. But let's continue here. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Uh, what did it say there? My dearly, uh, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for. What is the longing? Well, we read about it earlier, where the Bible's talking about, uh, you know, having. Let's see if I get the verse here real quickly, so I don't misquote it. Um, you know, having verse uh, chapter one, verse twenty-three. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You know, having a desire to be there with the body of Christ and greatly longing after them. Where's the stuff at in the time of Jacob's trouble? I mean, I'll grant you, people are going to be longing to, to see Jesus come back. But this thing of the body of Christ being gathered together. 
But where is this in the time of Jacob's trouble? I mean, if the body of Christ goes into there, are you really going to be longing for each other? Or are you going to be trying to survive without taking the mark? See, this whole system, this whole post-trib system is just so warped, it's, it's ridiculous to teach to Christians. It's just, it's insane. But let's continue. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Can you tell somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble that? Be careful for nothing. The uh, second trumpet's going to be opening tomorrow, and the red horse rider's coming out, and peace is going to be taken from the earth, but uh, don't worry about it. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace, Revelation 6, 4, the Lord takes peace from the earth with the red horse rider when he unleashes him. How do you reconcile that? And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Only works for us today. Doesn't work for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Not true if you're living in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hey, over half the world's population is going to be killed. Take the mark of the beast, you go to hell. Get God's wrath poured out on you. And you can live by these verses here. Verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Now how does that work out? If you're going to go into that time of Jacob's trouble. I'll give you a hint. It doesn't. The only way that you can have peace is to know Jesus Christ right now. Now, there will be a measure of peace for a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble, sure. Uh, you can have a measure of peace in, in, peace in, in when you're going to the death, you know, being taken to have your head cut off. The Bible says that that's going to happen. They're going to be behead uh, people in that time period. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 6. also talks about it in Revelation chapter 20, people that were beheaded for the Word of God. Uh, you can have peace there knowing that Jesus died for your sins and things. Sure, absolutely. But you're not going to have much peace in that time period, living through that time period. But you can have peace right now. See? You put your faith in Jesus Christ right now and you come to God as a sinner and understanding what you are and understanding the fact that you deserve hell. Okay? And you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you get saved today. You say, well, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm still not convinced. Well, then drop everything else and study the Word of God. You know, read this book until you are convinced. I don't tell you to just leap blindly into this thing and just become a Christian and just don't even think about it. Look at, you know, look into it and things. Absolutely, sure. Pray about it. Ask the Lord. Just pray and just bow your head and just say, God, if you're real, I want to know. In sincerity. Not sarcastically like these little atheists nobodies do. I'm talking about insincerity. Ask the Lord. I, I want to know. I don't want to be confused by man-made religions. I don't want to be confused by all the standards of the world and, and everything else. I want to know you personally. Show me what to do. And then you get this King James Bible, the greatest book that's ever been printed on this earth. You get a copy of this King James Bible and read it. Read the books of John and Romans. It's a good place to start. Read it. And see if uh, there's any other way into heaven but by Jesus Christ. And His righteousness being imparted to you. Being given to you. You can't earn your way into heaven. You are not a good enough person. You're a sinner. And the only way for a sinner to get into God's presence is if that sinner has a Savior who died in their place. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you 
again, Lord, for your, the precious promises that you've given to us as Christians. The fact that there's just so much that we can rely on in your word. We know it's true. We don't have to worry. We don't have to, to think about your wrath, Lord, coming down upon us. Uh, while it's true that we can experience some, some uh, bad times down here on this earth, and we certainly will as Christians. Uh, I've never taught that things are just a smooth ride for Christians. They're not. But uh, we have peace knowing that we're not facing your judgment and your wrath. And that uh, I've seen many times where you can protect us even in the worst situations. And Lord, if somebody's out there listening to this and they're not saved and they, they have questions, Lord, I pray that they would take their questions to you. And that they wouldn't look to men and uh, think to themselves that they have to worship a man to, to get into the right religious system. Nope, that's not it. They have to come to you and put their faith in Jesus Christ and uh, realize that Jesus and, and you, Heavenly Father, that they're one and the same. So they're not uh, listening to some other guy or whatever else. I just pray, Lord, for them out there. I know that there are, I'm very conscious of the fact that there are lost Jews, Lord, that are watching this channel, this ministry, and I thank you, Lord, for that opportunity to be able to get uh, to the Jewish people. And Lord, I pray that they would understand that, that uh, we love them here at, at King James Video Ministries. We, we love the Jewish people very dearly, and we pray for their salvation. Um, but we do not support everything that the nation of Israel does. Uh, there's some very wicked things going on in that nation, and there's some very wicked things that Jewish people are doing. They need to be saved just like any Gentile out there. They need to come to you as broken sinners and realize that their righteousness, that their heritage and things is, is not going to get them into heaven. I do pray for that, Lord, that uh, if there's Jews out there that are watching this, that they would think about it and that they would truly read the New Testament for themselves, apart from bias and, and uh, understanding that the Catholic Church is not New Testament Christianity, and uh, that they would get this done soon, Lord, get their salvation worked out between you and them, uh, because times are going to come that it's going to get very, very rough for the Jewish people. And uh, that's one of the big reasons for this ministry, Lord. We want to get to those Jews and get as many of them saved and out of the time of Jacob's trouble. They don't have to go through it, Lord. But I just, I do pray fervently for these people, Lord. We, I pray for them on and off camera and, and I just, all of us as Christians, Lord, I pray that you would challenge uh, your children out there to pray for the peace of Jerusalem to pray for the Jewish people because rough times are coming for them, Lord, and it's going to be much worse than the Holocaust. And I just, uh, I pray, Lord, that you'd keep all of us in your word, keep us praying, keep us witnessing, loving in judgment, and approving things that are excellent. And I ask it all in Jesus, uh, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that is going to be it for this study. I uh, have some more interesting things coming out here. Uh, please keep us in your prayers. We have uh, a lot of work that we're doing. We'll be talking about this in, in some other videos here. But uh, active and busy as usual. Uh, we, we try to stay very, very busy for the Lord. And um, I do believe time is short, and I believe that our time is very precious. Uh, the days are evil. We should redeem the time. So... That is going to be it. Thank you for your prayers. And uh, thank you to all who support this ministry. And um, that's going to be it. We'll see you next week's, uh, next week's study. <laughs> uh, that's going to be it. Thanks for watching.